course uh, content and to 5G in general. And we are going a bit deeper from now on till the end of the course. So the plan um, now is to look into spectrum um, aspects, specifically uh, spectrum sharing. Okay, so we're going to see some specific characteristics of um, that matters in terms of spectrum. Uh, so some specific aspects of radio environment uh, and how this maps to different ways to access the spectrum. So we're going to consider four techniques uh, to, to do spectrum access. Um, basically, we'll consider uh, spectrum sensing, cooperative spectrum sensing, geolocation database, and beaconing. Okay, some of these might ring a bell, some might not. Anyway, it doesn't matter, we're going through them. And we will focus especially on two bands um, that could be shared uh, by other systems than the primary user. Uh, and these are cellular bands, okay, normal mobile phone communication bands, and radar bands. Then we are going to go deeper into radar bands sharing because we are doing some research specifically on that. So how you can share bands used by radar systems with um, say mobile broadband communication systems. We are going to see then um, a basically a shared access scheme which is picking up right now in Europe. It's called licensed shared access. And how this can um, interact and interwork with the uh, cloud radio access network, Cloud Run. Okay, that will close the module one. Then in module two, which will start end of this week, we're going to look into some physical layer aspects. And then module three, we're going to look into some uh, new topologies uh, for 5G, so namely heterogeneous networks and dense small cell deployments. And then the last part of the course, which will take approximately eight to ten lectures. It's going to be on a research topic that we recently started uh, in my group, and it's uh, application of complex system science to communication networks. So with a special uh, eye on uh, 5G. Okay, so this course is about 5G, but we are going to see different aspects uh, of 5G. Um, so that's more or less the roadmap. So, now, uh, everybody keeps saying that the spectrum is scarce, which to some extent is true. On the other hand, I there are studies, I mean, I'm pretty sure many of you saw this picture before, uh, that show that uh, if you really go out and measure the spectrum occupancy in many different bands, okay, so here you see bands that are very low in carrier frequency, like 30 megahertz, up to something like 300 megahertz, so you have two orders. So you see basically a very big um, portion of spectrum here, right? So we have about uh, two orders of magnitude in terms of carrier frequency. And these bars, these horizontal bars that you see, it's dark blue, dark green, something like this, um, they are the percentage okay, of average occupancy of, of some of the bands. And you see, rarely they reach 25%. Mm, many times, they basically um, reach m much less in terms of occupancy, right? So what it means is that despite the high um, congestion of systems using bands that are below three gigahertz, the actual usage is much less than, than what uh, we would expect, okay? So it means that you could, without impacting the current systems, the current services, reuse this band. So when these guys are not using it, say, if, well, you see the military are, and you know, like uh, things like telemetry, GPS, they almost never use the band. Okay, they do use it, but the duty cycle is very, very low. What it means that the system 
operates in, in very uh, limited portions of the time. Okay? With radars, it's even worse because radars are also very directional. So it's very limited duty cycle, very small duty cycle, and also very directional. So it means that when the radar is not pointing at you, you could potentially use in the band. And that's not happening to a large extent at the moment. So the rationale here is that we need spectrum, of course. We need uh, an, an ever-increasing amount of spectrum. And it's not exactly true that the spectrum is scarce. Spectrum is there. It's just pure, poorly managed poorly utilized. That's the real situation. So that's kind of the motivation to a, lo a lot of research that has happened in the last 10 to 15 years. I would say 10 years and then maybe 15 years if you consider the software defined radio work um, on cognitive radio, right? So empowering networks uh, and radios uh, especially to adapt to the environment, okay, to check what's going on if for example, a certain channel is not in use, you should be able to use it uh, for your own um, sake, right? Um, in a nutshell, you try to sense, okay, the, the environment like um, a cognitive uh, being would do, like a person, okay, and, and then you, you act based on what you, you see. So it's like really a um, sensory system if you want just that instead of having living creatures we have radios okay um, so the idea is that basically you check um, over a certain band whether there is activity or not if there is no activity you use it or say you are using some band that then becomes non-available because the righteous owner came back right the licensed uh, user came back but then maybe another frequency becomes available so in time you can move around so right this is called uh, spectrum mobility basically you can can follow you know the the availability of the spectrum um, you might have heard about the cognitive radio cycle so this is a um, known uh, paradigm to model cognitive radio so you have your radio environment whatever happens in the in the medium uh, you do sensing with it can be done in many different ways. A basic way is to do energy detection. You just measure the energy on a channel. You compare with the threshold. If you are above the threshold, you declare the channel is occupied. If you are below the threshold, it means the activity is low or non-existent, and you can you can use it. Okay, you can do things that are fancier, like match filter, right? Uh, feature detection. You can do few things. Okay. Uh, it's not the goal of this course to go deeply into spectrum sensing, but <coughs> just to give you some idea. Based on the information you, con you collect, you then analyze. Okay? Analyze simply means um, you, you, you take a look okay? and you decide what is you know, the situation. So you, you, you basically check whether some portions of the spectrum are uh, usable and some might be not okay usable and eventually you take a decision which it boils down to transmit or not or, or to, to transmit or not to transmit right so um, all of this then loop is closed by the fact that when you transmit you impact the radio frequency environment and then again you start right and there are many other connections between the different uh, functionalities here but in the main you observe, you study the situation based on what you observe, you kind of understand what's going on, you decide. And then again, you, you observe, you try to understand what's going on, and then you, you act. There is a part of what um, a normal definition of cognitive radio would imply that is not shown here, and it's the learning part. Ideally, you shouldn't just adapt, right? This is adaptive. So you see what happens and then you take an action. You should also learn, right? Because some actions might turn out to be more successful than others. So there is a, a big body of research happening right now to do involved with uh, with learning in my group. Okay, not not exactly with my team, but in my research center, there is there is work going on. Just a couple of people are really experts in machine learning, and another one in deep learning. So there is 
good amount of activity going on in there. So um, if in some time of the day you realize the spectrum is always occupied, at some point maybe you shouldn't sense anymore in that time of the day, right? You know it's a lost cause. Uh, but on the other hand, it might be that uh, some situations are a bit more blurred, so you might need multiple sensors, right, to collect information and try to get a better idea, statistical idea of the occupancy. And that might be worse in some environments and not in others, okay? Uh, so the idea is basically you should decide what to do based on um, the past knowledge, right? On what you learned in the past. So it's not just that you should have a rigid way to adapt, right? Uh, um, basically, you know, a lookup table kind of thing. There should also be a way to modify this lookup table and, you know, have some memory of what you could learn in the past, right? At a glance. Yes. How do we estimate the bandwidth of uh, holes? The bandwidth of, sorry? Bandwidth of the spectrum holes. So means when you are estimating that there is a hole, so mm. can we estimate also the bandwidth of holes? Uh, yeah, I right. Uh, well, I guess it depends on the system. A lot of the cognitive radio systems, for example, assume a sort of OFDM. So you would do it per bin, per subcarrier, right? So your decision would be at that granularity. I guess that has to do probably with the system. My impression is that it's really like uh, there is not a huge difference between the way you you, ass you assume the frequency granularity in a cognitive radio and in a normal system. Eventually, they, there is some there are already some components of cognitivity in LTE, for example. So it's always depending on the modulation you you use. So. You would, uh, I mean, simply what you could do at the output of the um, FFT, at the, the receiver, per subcarrier, you measure the um, uh, amplitude squared, is the power, right? And then you have a th certain threshold in your mind, you compare with that. That's energy detection in, in OFDM. You can do many more complicated things. If you have a template of the signal, you can do much filter, right? And you, you might embed some cyclostationary signature in the signal and then you decode that so what's called feature detection and things so there are there are a few things you can do but technologically in terms if you if you think about modulation it's not different i mean you know it's just you add some functionalities to that yeah any other questions so please feel free to to interrupt me and ask me if something doesn't Yeah, I think I think that it's an added thing, right? So anything you add would be would be power cons um, you know uh, consuming. Now some things are fairly straightforward, like this uh, energy detection. I don't believe is that complicated to do. Okay, I don't have figures now I can give you, but I think it's it depends on what you do. If you do things like match filter, probably you're right. It starts to be a bit heavy. Now one thing you tend to do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. You can also get help from other mobile phones. Like what they do with cooperative sensing is that. So you do a simple thing like yes or no, like energy detection, but then you combine the information and you take decision based on some rule, can be and, or, majority, many other things. And then the real processing is happening in a central node, could be the base station, for example. So you can actually, you know, uh, lift a lot of the... Um, uh, computational complexity from the mobile phone if you do that. Um, I think many things though, even if we don't realize it, are already happening because the LTE phones, they already take quite a few measurements, right? You have this RSSI uh, kind of um, uh, measurement taking place and then other variants of that. So something to do with uh, res total receive power. Um, you do continuously give feedback about the channel quality uh, state, right? Uh, there is this CQI feedback happening in LTE system. So even if we don't realize it, our phone is already sensing the spectrum somehow, okay? Maybe it doesn't do the very complicated sensing, but something is already happening. And anyway, you have ways to get um, 
away, uh, uh, you know, with sensing. I think a general trend, you want to keep the mobile phones light, in terms of especially because of power consumption, and you tend to move a lot of the intelligence at, um, at the base station, right? So I think sensing is probably the same thing. You try to do, uh, take measurements in the mobile phones, but then the decision is always taken anyway by, by the base station. Unless you have ad hoc networks and stuff like this, but then it's another story, I think. Okay, so there are actually basically three ways because cooperative sensing is just a sub a set of sensing that are there, as far as I'm aware, to, to sense uh, what we call white spaces. White spaces are basically um, the spectrum holes, right? So normally in this kind of cognitive radio terminology, when you talk about white, it's a nice color, and then it means the spectrum is free. Black is normally associated with something negative, so the spectrum is occupied, more or less. So that's, so the dark spaces would be heavily occupied, right? But the white spaces means the spectrum is available, so you can do it either having a database that, you know, contains information about uh, what system is licensed in that spectrum. So for example, carrier frequency, the bandwidth, uh, the times where the system would be active, the pattern of the radiation, right, antenna radiation pattern, uh, these kind of things. The thing with database normally is that it is a bit long term. Hmm? So you can update the database, but it's not something that happens on a millisecond base, like LTE frame. It's not at that scale. It's probably a few hours at least, or days maybe. Um, beacon signals simply means that you do embed some information in the primary, so the licensed system transmission. Say you have um, a radar system that has to share the band with another system. So you would embed some information about uh, the radar transmission, which is, uh, can be used by the secondary system to understand what's going on, okay? So you would help, in a sense, the secondary system not to disturb you, okay? Would tell you, look, in this region, I'm the one using it, stay out of it, and then you know, when you don't see the signature, then you can use it, something like that. Um, sensing is essentially, uh, as the name says, sensing. So you are trying to basically measure the uh, activity in a certain channel and then you know, deciding whether this channel is free or not. Now, as you might have guessed, it's not one, I mean, when you have a threshold involved, and the sensing essentially has to do with comparing with the threshold, right? Yeah, to decide the occupancy or not. Um, you you can't say it's a uh, very definite um, thing. So eventually there is always something happening. Okay, just the, the real question is, is it the activity, is it like close enough to me so that I disturb the, the primary system if I am active or not? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that you have to define your margin. Okay, so how much uh, are you allowing, um, you know, in terms of interference, right? You can be very conservative and set a threshold very low. So you mean it means that as soon as there is a little bit of uh, activity, you back off, mm? or you can be more aggressive. That depends on the agreement between the primary and secondary system. And it depends, of course, on how far you are between the two systems, right? The more far away you are, the easier it is. And then you can, uh, you can use uh, the spectrum in a, like, um, you know, in a, in a smoother way. If you are closer, then you have to be more careful, right? So there is, there is a bit of that uh, when you do sensing. So there is a table here that shows different categories of, um, uh, you know, uh, technological capabilities and, uh, or technological factors. And then you have, for example, the infrastructure cost. You see that sensing normally is low because it doesn't imply changes of a, a, at an infrastructure or network basis. Hmm? So you just have to do something small normally. And it can even be something we already can do, OK? Um, legacy uh, compatibility, this too, again, would imply big changes in terms of, of the system. This basically already happening to some extent. Uh, complexity in terms of the transceiver, though, you see that 
basically this is going to impact the mobile phones why you know these two are basically not messing up with the user equipment uh, and so on okay so you can have a look so you would have different basically uh, requirements and capabilities and different pros and cons for the different techniques so there is no best solution there are different solutions so depending on what your goal is you will basically pick one technique or another hmm? for example for beacon you see because you embed some information you do need to change the frame structure of the license system so you do need to embed some information to help the secondary system to collaborate with you in a sense so it will use the spectrum when you allow the secondary system so you kind of collaborate but that implies you need to, to change actually the standard okay so it's a big thing um, any questions so far? Um, I think it's more of a passive collaboration like the, um, this beacon is more that okay so what I think is one system basically using the control channel to, to do that so um, there is actually some activity on this common uh, pilot cognitive pilot channel I think you know and the, the I think they are assuming like kind of a universal control channel okay for for these things normally though um, I mean as far as I'm aware there are few approaches okay so the traditional cognitive radio approach the the onus is completely on the secondary system okay first of all maybe somebody is not familiar with this terminology L primary system is the system that owns the license okay what we call incumbent incumbent because it's already there okay for example in radar bands the primary system is a radar system is also the license system secondary system would be normally some uh, a system that originally was not meant to use that band but there is a new agreement or you know some new technological capability like cognitive radio and it allows that system which is secondary to use the band when the primary allows or the primary is not disturbed okay so that's, that's what they call primary and secondary so primary is licensed more or less secondary is unlicensed not in the sense of Wi-Fi but it's unlicensed it doesn't own the license okay so the in the spectrum sensing um, cap uh, possibility it's more the secondary that has to do the job right normally but when you go into that uh, like beacon I think it's reversed it's more the primary that has to do something and why it's a good idea to do it because it would it would be beneficial to you like it's like in a sense shouting at the guy look stay out of this and just when I'm not shouting at you you are using it right um, database I think it could be both uh, I, normally both would contribute so there would be some information coming from the primary user say the general information about the band the location the time activity but then this could be also you know uh, the database could be fed by sensing information why would that be useful for example you could have you could even even have a third party offering this service right I'm a secondary system like mobile operator I'm using a band of a radar and then there is a company doing sensing and they will refine the information I get from the database so they would offer this service either to the primary or to the secondary and why is sensing good because for example the, the problem with database is that it's long term right so but things might change so and situation might change spatially also so that if you have sensors in different parts of the area they can tell you uh, they can give you some better granula granularity in space right in some region sensors might pick up something some other they might not so this would refine so even if say you have an original picture which tells you all a certain area is uh, off limits maybe the sensors will tell you no wait maybe just this half is off limits right um, and in fact when you um, like in the beginning cognitive radio was meant to be just about sensing okay but then there was some message from few parties including FCC which said no this won't work out you definitely need some database component to make it reliable you know to make it uh, um, really f uh, feasible in terms of uh, quality of service for 
for essentially for the primary also right uh, mainly for the primary so now people are more thinking of an integration of database and sensing for example systems like uh, PCAST in US or LSA in Europe envision both both uh, sensing and, and database usage hmm? mm -hmm. Depends on, I guess, the uh, width, right, of the beam. So you're saying if it's very, like, very yeah, correct. Uh, have have a very I think I think you might might have a point. I'm not aware, honestly, of too much work on that. So it might be something you might be interested in looking into. But it is it is you have a good point in the sense. I think to some extent you could quanti you can always quantize yeah. things, right? So you could say. Well, you can accommodate six sectors, and that's fine. You know, that's uh, even if you do your beam forming, let's say, on a three-degree basis, maybe, you know, your granularity would be 60 degrees for the database, and that's okay. And that's where sensing would be a good idea, I think, right? Um, still, you would have to store this information somewhere. So maybe you could do, you could have, in that case, the sensing not integrated with the database and just telling you locally, right, kind of, so that might make more sense in that case. I think, I in a sense, some of the um, problems are new because there is this new 5G, uh, right, batch of technologies, but cognitive radio has been there for a while. So maybe, you know, there is there has not been yet a very uh, big integration of the topics. And so, so I think something might happen in that space. Um, same thing goes, by the way, with small cells, right? If you have a lot of the small cells, so might be consuming, right? Um, now, one good thing about um, about uh, the wireless system is that it's not that there is no coherency at all. There is some coherence, right, in uh, in the thing. So it might be that you know, if you pick up some pattern, you don't have to store all in all the information, right? So there is a big scope for, especially in database management um, and data collection, for machine learning. Uh, deep learning, uh, Bayesian uh, approaches, right? So if you learn something about the system, you don't have to store all the time, all the information, right? So for example, I'm just saying something now out of, uh, you know, like uh, just to throw it on the table. One thing, for example, you have is coherence of the, there's some coherence in the path, right? So definitely if you have a train system, it's very much deterministic, the path. Even if you have like um, people moving in a car in a city, right? The roads are what they are, right? So you don't have to sense all the time everywhere. So you have some information from the city planning, from the way, for example, people move and people work in a business area during the day, but they go in a residential area during the night. So there, there is a lot to do with data fusion, okay, happening. Um, integrating different information, this big data analytics is a big part now of this um, business okay so so there is hope in the sense that very smart people in AI and learning are actually looking closely into this problem so that will help I think but eventually there is a limit in the um, storage capability in the processing capability in the time there is no use of uh, for a database that will have all the information of this world but that will take forever to, to to give a decision right so you do need to be a bit light in a sense or so in that. I think, yes. Sorry, the beam forming? Depends on how many antennas you have. If you have at least two, it can. If you have one antenna, no. Then you just have to rely on uh, the, the transmit, say, beam forming from the base station. Yeah. If you can have both, yeah, they combine, that's good. But Depends on yeah, the capability of the. I know that I'm not sure how advanced are mobile phones, honestly, in terms of multiple antennas. I suppose they do selection, diversity, stuff like this. I'm not too sure whether beam forming is really there at the moment. Maybe not. Um, don't talk. Ab don't think about the papers. I'm talking about the real, the real system. No, so probably not too advanced MIME at the moment. In which figure, sir? Yeah. 
Good question. Uh, I think in general, um, well, in the past, it was a bit neutral. So when people were talking about secondary system, and I think they thought of, this, of a new network altogether, right? Something like, I don't know, ad hoc or a new network that would use the spectrum. I think nowadays uh, it's changed a bit. And in my opinion, mostly now they mean mobile network operators. So uh, definitely with radars and those systems, they are the primary and maybe MNO mobile network operators would be the secondary, okay? You could even have things like um, uh, different operators that can be primary or s secondary, okay? Depending on, on the role they have. You could have things like um, local operators and more global operators. Could be, yeah, I, I think honestly, uh, Right now, I'm working mostly, I mean, in this domain, um, the work I'm doing more or less assumes that the secondary are mobile network operators, but it doesn't have to be. In the past, it didn't, it wasn't the case. In the past, it was maybe that the mobile operator was the incumbent, right? And then you would have uh, uh, secondary systems to be something else. So I think it's, the definition is general. So, you know, whenever you have a licensee, sorry, a, li a licensed uh, user, that's the primary. Whoever tries to use uh, that band is a secondary. So that's, that's really all there is in the definition. And then, you know, uh, it's up to, up to the researcher to define the specifics uh, of, the, of the problem. I think a lot of work now assumes that the secondary are mobile network operators, actually. Was a question? Sorry, yeah. In uh, all these spectrums, every spectrum is having their own units and they are having their own power and mm. sensitivities. Suppose mm. mm. cognitive radio, up to what level it can sense? Mm. Suppose my system is working up to X level. Yes. Cognitive radio is sensing up to above that one. Yes. Then cognitive radio will indicate there is no spectrum there. But really, that signal is going on. Yes, but you see what. Type of things how Correct, but you know what you what the requirement is. You have to, um, let's say, you have to how to put it. So the the primary system would require a certain quality of of service. Okay, so in a sense, uh, say within a region, they will tell you if you pick that much of a signal above that, stay out of it because I'm using it, right? But if on, if in that reason you pick something below that, you're good. So anything from your sensitivity to, you know, um, above. So you have to see where the threshold is, right? So definitely your system should have a sensitivity which is below the threshold. If not, you're illegally using the band. You see my point? If you're always, uh, you know, in the wrong place compared to the threshold, then it's not, um, it's not what, uh, what you want. So um, I think what you have to do is to make sure that, you know, you, you can catch the activity if you do catch it, then you're good, okay? So, and, and that's it, really, okay? So, um, there are some indications for some uh, sensitivity, okay? So, we are going to see some examples later. Um, now, the main message here is not whether you can uh, sense it or not. So, if you are operating in that band, it means you are able to sense it, okay? So, there is no, I mean, you can do some misdetection sometimes, but in principle, your technology will be able to decide. The real question here is whether the, what we call exclusion zones, right? So the regions where you cannot use the spectrum because the primary is in operation, whether they are too conservative. And most of the times they are, right? So that we're going to see this better. But practically what happens is that most of the time it's overdimensioned. So the, the exclusion zones are really too conservative, okay? So you get a lot of, uh, uh, you squander a lot of opportunities in terms of where you can use the spectrum. So if you could shrink these co coverage, uh, these exclusion zones in the in the new area that is available, you can transmit the secondary. Okay. So in other words, you know, if your sensitivity 
is below the quality of service threshold. That's what you should have. If it's above, you are in trouble because your system is useless. You see my point? You're always going to say it's occupied. So at the very least, you're, you should have the sensitivity that is lower than the threshold. And then you see where you are. Now, the real question is where you position this threshold. I think that's, that's the interesting problem. Yes. Yes. So there, the spectrum will be spread to around correct. Yes. So how do you create? How will it be sensed? Because in that television, it's sensing very different. Yes. Uh, I think uh, correct. Um, you're right. I mean, there are two operation uh, modes for uh, cognitive radio. Basically, uh, one is called underlay. One is called overlay. So underlay means it's like uh, ultra wideband. You you basically transmit at a low power over a very large portion of spectrum, right? And you do it at a low enough power so that you don't disturb the system. So it's sort of what SPAS spectrum does, right? And then you have the overlay. You basically check over the spectrum the portions where there is no activity, and then you use this kind of, um, you basically have windows of activity, right? You don't, you're not active over all the band, but just in the portion of the band. Uh, where um, you know where the things uh, where the, the the activity is not there. So, for example, systems like OFDM, they lend themselves very well into overlay, right? Because you use some bunch of subcarriers and some others you don't, and then the ones that where you don't use um, that the ones that you don't use, that's where the secondary can transmit. SPAT spectrum, um, it's 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 different because you do have. Um, like uh, as you say, like you have a transmission overall um, the um, the spectrum. Now, what I, I I'm not an expert in CDMA and this kind of system. What I know is that they're very robust to interference and to to noise. Uh, that's the whole point, right? So, and you, you the the way you distinguish the signals is based on codes, so, right? The code is the important thing. So, whatever happens in between, I think if it's not crazy, the interference you will manage, I guess, right? So. Correct. No, no, but you know, I correct. I, I think th th I, I didn't work on these problems, you know, of coexisting with um, space spectrum systems. What I think might happen, um, okay, what I know is that uh, CDMA systems are robust to narrowband interference. Okay, so for example, uh, you could potentially transmit without bothering too much, right? It might be a bit a different story if you are transmitting over, like in an underlay mode. So I think overlay would probably suit better this kind of systems, like if you have to share the spectrum. Underlay might be a bit more complicated. On the other hand, I know that CDMA systems are very robust, uh, right? They can operate at very low signal to noise ratio. So maybe it's not um, a very difficult um, problem. Now, consider also that though more or less all the new systems are not operating based on spread spectrum, right? So this is a technology that was, to my knowledge, only applied in 3G systems. So it's kind of slowly, you know, uh, getting out of fashion. So you might not need exactly that spectrum, okay? So there is much more spectrum available, which is more compatible with uh, OFDM-like or multi-carrier-like systems, okay? But I think my feeling is that if you want to do that, probably a narrowband system would be better. Right, and you might not need to sense anything, I guess. Right, if you're just narrowband, that's probably good enough. But you know, I never worked on that, so it's a bit of a speculation. Okay, yes, Correct. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. It moves into a domain um, which is a bit outside of my expertise, but it is a relevant uh, question. So the question is, uh, what are the, in a sense, the incentives to the primary, right? So if you use their band, do you have to pay anything? Is it freelance, something like that, right? That's your question, more or less. Yeah, no, sorry. Yes.
correct, but then you're doing an illegal thing. You see my point? I mean, unless it's an unlicensed band, yes, you're right. Unlicensed band, in fact, that's what happens, right? Anybody can, can use it, you can have your access point doing your stuff. Uh, your microwave oven is not arrested because it's transmitting that band, right? It's, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's legal, okay? But when you use licensed bands, then it's another story, right? You need, I mean, you can do it, of course, like a pirate radio, but then they, they will shut you down at some point. So the, the, the thing is that you buy these at an auction normally, right? you pay a lot of money, and then you want to use it, right? Or you are a service of national relevance, like military, defense, airports, right? So it's not that everybody can go and mess up with uh, Kolkata Airport or with the Indian Army, right? Again, you can try it and you're arrested. So I, I think <laughs> there is, um, you know, th there is something you cannot do. Now, on the other hand, there are new regimes like uh, LSA, where it is, they are meant to be more uh, along the lines of what you're saying. So you do have somebody, yes, that own the license, but you also have an encouragement uh, slash command from the government that you should share. Because of uh, this slide, you know, things are really inefficient and we do re really need a lot of spectrum for this new broadband network, so you cannot have this going on too long. So you will keep the band as an incumbent, but you have to coexist, okay? So the, your incentive, in a sense, could just be as simple as you keep using it. If not, if you're not happy, we take it away, okay? And, and that's one way. Some other people are advocating the, there's, there has to be a financial compensation, either to the government or to the license. And then there are also works on auction. I, I did myself and my group some work on that. So how you basically create an auction to distribute the um, additional spectrum. So there is definitely a lot of good work going on on the more economical side o of the story, right? Um, so yeah, no, definitely it's, it's, it's a relevant uh, part of the story. Okay, so um, I want just to give you some ideas about, uh, I'm not going into all the details because it's fairly detailed. So there is a paper I mentioned here where all the details are given. So what I'm trying to, to show here is some mapping between uh, characteristics of the radio environment, what we call radio environment factors or RE factors, and then some requirements of different spectrum access techniques. So in this case, for example, we talk about spectrum sensing. Hmm? So for example, um, uh, let's say you take um, complexity, okay, how complex computationally complex is spectrum sensing. So one thing that clearly will impact is the diversity of primary users, right? So if in a certain band you have a few systems operating, and it can be the case, right? It can be that you have multiple systems more or less in the same band. So if you have to take into account all of those systems, which have all, uh, all, all of them have different requirements, you will have to come up with a fairly complicated way to sense. So it's not one threshold anymore, maybe it's a set of thresholds, right? And you have to keep checking all of these things. Um, other things that can impact, um, when we say in-band sensing, it means that you are using your band, uh, say you are a secondary system, you have a certain band for communication, and in the same band, you do transmission and sensing. So sometimes you do sensing, sometimes you do transmission. What can help that? Uh, it's, for example, if you have a way to separate your uplink and downlink for the secondary system, right? Because when you transmit in downlink, you might sense in uplink and vice versa. This could be FDD or TDD, doesn't matter. But if you have a way to separate your communication, if you have a, a proper duplex in place, then this, this makes it easier for the sensing. Um, of course, you know, for example, mobility and dynamics of the um, incumbent of the licensed system makes a difference. So talk about the radar. If the radar moves around, say a shipborne or a airborne uh, radar, it moves, right? And it's very difficult to track such a thing, right? So it's not a static thing. So you have to somehow understand the path, right? The, the primary system is moving if you want to estimate the spectrum. So what you estimate at a certain time is not what you will estimate uh, at, at, at another time. So there are things that can complicate the picture quite a bit. Hmm? Yes.
Yes. So if two sensors, yeah. yes, yes, correct. Uh, between the primary and the secondary, or between the second? Yes. Um, okay. Again, it depends on what system you are using. For example, what they uh, consider when you use LSA is license shared access. Only one. Uh, secondary can be active in a certain region at a certain time over a certain bandwidth. So it's what we call exclusive sharing. You do share, but not, uh, you see, not uh, at the same time, same band. So it's kind of as if you were the only one. Okay, and so there cannot be this case of two secondaries clashing because you would only allow one. Okay, in the in the um, specific uh, region and time and frequency. Okay. Um, in other situations, there might be a clash. I mean, if you have like a more wild scenario where uh, every secondary system can sense, yes, can happen then, you know, but then um, you have to live with that. So it's like uh, Wi-Fi, it's something like that, right? So even if you don't have a license, still, you, it's the best effort thing. You give it a try, if it doesn't work, you try again. And yeah, it's uh, cheap, but it's also, n it doesn't provide quality of service. This definitely operators don't want. So if your secondary system is a mobile operator, they will never buy that. In fact, they are more standing uh, behind LSA because they get some quality of service guarantees. Hmm? So it also depends on um, the requirements, the expectations of the secondary system, right? So the, the sorry, what is less? The uh, transmit the power? Yeah. Yes, so the chances of collision between secondary users should be less because their area of transmission is limited. Uh, yeah, but you know, it, it depends again on what is your secondary system. I think you're right. If the system is, um, well, for example, mm, one example I have in my mind is radar bands, and radar transmitted to very high power, so they cover very big areas, right? Like tens of kilometers. Uh, a mobile tower could go as far as a few kilometers, right? So, and uh, and uh, small cell not. Uh, I think in that sense, it's not different than any normal, uh, you know, radio resource management. These problems are there anyway, whether you have you are using the band of somebody else or not. So, the discriminant when you, when it gets a cognitive radio flavor is when you introduce another layer systems that are different and you all, I mean what you say is true but it's always true regardless of whether we are using a shared band or not what makes it different in cognitive radio spectrum sharing is that you also have to take care of the interference to another system right so you have two uh, it's like one is in a sense vertical towards another system one is horizontal like within your system yeah and of course power is uh, yeah it's what matters I mean so I think in general um, I think one thing that is more relevant is what we call aggregate interference. So eventually what matters, it's how, um, you, how much you disturb the license system, the primary system. So if you have a lot of secondary you know, transmitters, it's not just one interfering, it's the sum of them, right? So in fact, a big factor which defines the size of the exclusion zones is the aggregate interference. They call it aggregate interference margin. AIM, okay? And the more dense is your secondary network, the higher that margin will be, because just keep adding, right? Sorry. Yes, I, it's linear, right? The more things transmitting, the higher is the power, yeah. The quantity of data. Um, Yes. Okay. So similarly, if uh, switching can be done for a secondary user, mm -hmm. then uh, I think a proper billing of the secondary user can also be done. That means you can charge the person or mm -hmm. the secondary user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, consider again, I'm, I think, you know, we are a bit under the impression that secondary is really like something else than what we are used to, like a new cognitive. 
I think it used to be the case. I think right now it's, it could be really a mobile operator. So whatever billing they adopt, they would just add another band, okay? So I think it's not necessarily true that you have to reinvent everything. Now, an operator has a billing system. So whether they get another bit of band or not, it won't change the story, right? They might offer a better service, so that might have an implication in terms of what they can sell, of the price. You know, if you sell a better service, you might charge more. But in terms of, the, it's like, you know, what I was answering to your colleague, the things that you were doing before still stand, right? So the billing, the interference management, it gets different when you start to see how you impact or you are impacted by the primary system. Whatever else stays the same, especially if you have secondary systems that are mobile networks. Because these guys have been in business forever. They keep being in business, right? So the fact that they get this extra spectrum won't change many things, okay? Uh, so many things stay the same. Good question. Um, there's been definitely a lot of trials. Um, I know they were doing work with uh, 802.22. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. EF, what is that? Yeah. 21, 802.21 EF. Yeah. Okay. I don't think, honestly, that nothing, it doesn't ring a very uh, big bell, uh, these uh, cognitive radio products, so I suspect not too many. There might be some. I think, uh, I mean, I know for certain, talking with the industry and so on, there is a much better chance that um, other systems, uh, other ways to do spectrum sharing uh, will make it into a product. So I think LSA or PCAST in US, I think that might lead to something. But I don't see it as a new product in a sense. I see it as um, adding some capabilities to your current mobile phone. Yeah. Uh, there might be some. I'm not fully aware of that. So at least the research I'm doing is more aligned with LTE and enabling new spectrum for LTE. The traditional cognitive radio work, it looks a bit stuck to me honestly okay so there has been a lot of work going on still a lot of work going on but uh, again it, it's it, I don't see it really as a you I mean there is a big problem in terms of quality of service guarantee and so it didn't fly completely okay so I think there has been standards there has been many activities TV white spaces sort of same story uh, there was a super Wi-Fi like l very long range Wi-Fi in Singapore right demonstration again products not many I mean, might be examples you know, I wouldn't say too many no sir, sir, when you are talking about the LSA so mm. basically you are talking about we are talking about two mobile operators mm. and they are basically physically co-located when you yes. are talking about sharing the spectrum yes so why are we in, why are we using the term primary user secondary user we can use no, there the is term still of two primary no, yes. They can share the Correct. Um, time right. I mean, normally, when you say, uh, I see your point. Normally, I mean, the normal definition for LSA would be that primary are something else. Could be a radar system. And then you have several secondary that are sort of not competing, but you know, they are accessing the additional band in turn. Some people talk about uh, a first class. Uh, mo mobile operator second class could be something global something local but I my feeling is that to talk about primary and secondary you have to have some difference in the capabilities and the requirements if not you're right if not you talk about I mean there's been a lot of work on interoperator spectrum sharing yeah, that's no I totally agree with that yes that's that's correct Yeah, I think, you know, normally primary means that you have the legal right. Yeah, where is having legal right? Correct. Legal right, but this question is if you are in the same, you know, there is no primary I agree. Right? I agree. I agree with that. Yes. Primarily, the genesis of cognitive radio was more to do with the availability of spectrum. Yes. Uh, spectrum which is lesser use. Yes.
No, that, that would be radio resource management. I mean, you know, I don't think that's really cognitive or still there are there are some cognitive capabilities you know it depends on how you define it right because if you look if you look into sensing mobile phones do, do a lot of that already so you know there are different angles i think in general you think of really a class of systems that have the license they paid for that they or you know they got the permission and then somebody else with the lower um you know set of rights uh, and that's that's normally what you call a cognitive system you know Yes, no, you, you do need to make sure that the primary still is happy. So there are actually, you can use as much as you are allowed. If not, there are actually, uh, we are doing ourselves in, in Trinity, work on policy detection, uh, po sorry, policy violation detection and enforcement. So you, you punish somebody that doesn't do properly, right? You either ban the guy to access the spectrum for a few days, I don't know. So if you have, of course, to enforce the thing and they have to obey, right, to rule. So you cannot allow uh, anarchy. So there has to be a possibility to, to basically uh, enforce the rules. So you have to, you are told usually by a database uh, what you can do and then you stick to that. If not, you're punished, okay? I'll move a bit on. Uh, okay, I think we are basically almost ready to start the new lecture. Um, I think I'll stop here and then we'll start tomorrow. Any last question? Comment? No? So we have a lecture now, the IEEE lecture, and then we'll start again tomorrow at 11.30. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's great actually, by the way, that you ask questions and interact. I like it very much. So keep, keep doing that. Okay, thanks.